Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today on ICMDA webinars, we've got our dear friend, Dr. Jay Smith, backing in for the fourth of his series on understanding Islam, the Quranic manuscripts. So uh, it's my delight again to introduce Dr. Jay Smith, on the in the fourth and final uh, talk of his series on understanding Islam, we've we've done uh, Mecca, we've done Muhammad, and this uh, this week we'll be focusing on the Quranic manuscripts themselves. And Muslim tradition teaches that the Quran we use today originated with Muhammad, was finally canonized by Uthman in 652 AD, and that not one word nor one letter has changed in the last 1400 years. But what do the Quranic manuscripts actually reveal? That's our question. This webinar is going to evaluate the various Quranic manuscripts in existence today, comparing their texts and ages and identifying their possible literary sources. Dr. J. Smith has worked with Muslims since 1983. He has two master's degrees and completed his PhD in Islamics in the areas of apologetics and polemics in 2017. Jay is one of Christianity's principal public evangelists and debaters to the Muslim world. He travels extensively, teaching apologetics for those exploring ministry to Muslims and engages the movers and thinkers of Islam on a weekly basis. He's the founding member of the Hyde Park Christian Fellowship, a weekly evangelism ministry to Muslims in London's public places, as well as a co-founder for the Fanda Center for Apologetics. Jay, it's a delight. Pleasure to have you back here again. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Well, welcome back, all of you, from your great conference in Tanzania. And uh, we're now going to get right into it. I have an awful lot to go through, so I'm going to go lickety-split. Just put your pens down. You're not going to keep up with me. We do have the PowerPoint, and you can follow the PowerPoint if you want to see the recording later. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and start our talk for today. In search of a book, we looked at a search of the place, we looked at in search of the man, now we're looking at in search of the book. And of course, that is the news research that we're going to look at concerning the history of the Quran. So what do Muslims claim about the Quran? Well, they claim four things. The first thing they claim is that it's uncreated. It exists eternally on clay tablets. That's in chapter 85, 22 of the Quran. They claim that it was sent down to Muhammad between 610 and 632 AD. They claim that the Quran was completed by Uthman in 652. And that from that time, the last 1400 years, it has not been changed. So not one word, not one letter. So uncreated, sent down completed, unchanged. Those are the four things every Muslim anywhere, except possibly the liberals, would claim. We would not make these claims. We know the Bible was created. It is written by man. We even put down the names of the authors for many of the books, not sent down to anyone. It was inspired by God, but written down by men. It was complete in its original form, but we don't have the original form. There, We don't have any original manuscripts. We make that very clear. And the Bible has changed here and there in a few places, about 40 verses that we know of. And we say exactly where they are in Mark 16, chapter 9 for, through 20, uh, John chapter 7, verse 53 to John chapter 8, verse 11, and especially 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. Those are verses we know about, and we warn the reader that those verses are not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts. So we do know that here and there, there have been some variants. What my remit there today is this. I'm not going to confront the idea, notion of uncreated or sent down about the Quran, because why? I can't critique that because I'm Wow, how do you critique uncreated eternality? Sent down, I wasn't there in the seventh century. But the last two claims they make, I am going to ask questions about. And that is, I'm going to critique complete and unchanged. Is or the Quran that we have a complete Quran? Was it from the very beginning? Has it changed? So this is my remit. 
I would like any Muslim, uh, if, if there is Muslims, any Muslims listening, to provide me with one Quranic manuscript from the mid-century, that's 652, that is complete, that has 114 surahs, and that is unchanged. That this Quran that I have in my hand here is exactly like that manuscript, word for word, letter for letter, just like the manuscript that you're going to show me. That's all I'm asking. That's a pretty simple task. That shouldn't be very difficult if Muslims continue to claim that they have the Quran that goes right back to 652, complete and unchanged. Now, the 13 areas I'm going to investigate very quickly. What do modern Muslims claim? What did early Muslims say? The historical anachronism, source criticism. We're going to go into the compilation, how the Quran was put together. The diacritical variants, the six earliest Quranic manuscripts. We're going to look at the two Sana Palimpsests, the four carbon dating lab reports, the 4,000 consonant variants, the 63 earliest extant fragments, the 1924 Huff's canonized text, the one we're using today, and the new Aramaic proto-Quran research, which is absolutely exciting, but more later. Let's get right into what do modern Muslims claim. Fethullah Gulen from Turkey, an influential Turkish cult leader, says the Quran is unaltered, unedited, and untampered. Here you have Suzanne Hanif. She is a convert, well-known uh, today uh, on the internet. She says the Quran is preserved today in its exact original form. Here you have Abdul Yusuf Ali, the, the, the most uh, authoritative Translator for the Quran in the English language, he says not a single letter has changed. Maulvi Muhammad Ali, uh, who comes from the Ahmadiyya movement, uh, he said not even a diacritical point has changed. That means not even the dots above and below the letters have changed. Dr. Shabir Ali, considered to be the world's leading debater on the Quran uh, in the Muslim world today, he says that the Quran is exactly identical for over 1,300 years. He goes on to say that Muslims have not quarreled over what is the text for 1,400 years. We find no difference from that copy to what we're reading today. And then I'm going to end with Dr. Yasar Qadi, the leading authority in the English-speaking world on the Quran, especially on the Qiraats, and he says not one word, not a letter has changed in the Quran. So why do they make these claims? Well, they have to. They have no other choice. The Quran makes these claims. Eternality is right there in chapter 85, verse 21 to 22. As far as not one word, not letter, uh, that's right there in chapter 10, verse 15. It's also repeated in chapter 18, verse 27. But the reason it cannot be changed is because Allah himself, in chapter 15, verse 9, it says, Allah will guard it. He will keep it from being changed. Therefore, there's no way that any man can change one letter or one word. The Quran we have in our hand today is the eternal Quran, the one that was sent to Muhammad, the one that was compiled by Uthman, and the Quran that has not ever changed for 1400 years. Conclusion, the Quran we have is not changed one iota since its inception. That Quran we have today is exactly the same as that which is on the preserved tablets in heaven. Every word, every letter is the same. That our Quran parallels, they would say in every detail, that which was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad was written down completely by Uthman and has never changed in 1400 years. Now, that's a huge claim. And you can see all the Muslims are making that claim, bar none. They all make those claims. But is that what the earliest Muslim scholars believe? Let's take a look and let's see what they used to say, at least in the 9th and 10th century, over a thousand years ago. These are the ones that are the first to come up with their reverence. Let's look here. Here you have Ibn Abi Dawud. Some verses he admits were lost. Here you have a Suyuti. He says, let none of you say I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say I have acquired what has survived. Woo, two, 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 two. That's quite a mouthful. Sahih Muslim, well, the second of the most authoritative hadith compilers, said some verses were forgotten. Here you have Sahih al-Buhari, who says some verses were canceled. He goes on and says that some verses were missing. Then you have Ibn Abi Dawud, who says some verses were overlooked. According to Muatta Ibn Malik, he says some verses were changed. Abi Ibn Dawud, who is from the 19th century, says some verses were modified. And according to Sahih Buhari, again from the 9th century, says that some verses were substituted. And then you have Sunan Ibn Majah, who says that even some verses were eaten by sheep. Now, let's summarize that. 
lost, for disappeared, forgotten, canceled, missing, overlooked, changed, modified, substituted, eaten by sheep. Folks, does this sound like a book which was compiled perfectly and completely? Can you see? Certainly, the the <laughs> the earliest compilers believed that there were intentional human intervention right through its initial compilation. So the modern scholars today are not following what the earliest scholars used to say. There has there seems to be a disconnect. When you look inside the Quran, you see there's lots of historical problems. I'm not going to go into them. This would take too much time. In chapter 20, verse 85 to 87, it note, it talks about the Samaritan. Yet, hold on a minute. Samaritans did not exist at the time of Moses. This story is during the time of Moses. There you see the golden calf. And it was the Samaritan who built the golden calf. Samaritans were only created after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel by Sargon II, the Assyrian king, in 720. 22 BC. That's folks, that's 700 years later. In chapter 17, verse 1, it says that this whoever this prophet went to the from the Masjid al Haram to the Masjid al Aqsa, that is in Jerusalem, according to what Muslims say today. The problem is there was no mosque in Jerusalem in 621 when this event supposedly took place. The Dome of the Rock that most people look at is was built in 691. The Masjid al-Aqsa that most Muslims claim is where he went to was built in 710. And this event took place in 621. And they cannot talk about the Jewish temple of Jerusalem that he went to because that was destroyed in 70 AD. Another historical anachronism. It mentions in chapter 34, verse 10 to 11, that David created some chain mail. To, yet David lived in 1000 BC. Coats of chain mail were not invented in 200 BC. That's 800 years later, folks. You can see some problems here. The Quran attributes crucifixions uh, to the time of Moses, where Pharaoh sends to twice in chapter 7 and in chapter 20. <clears throat> he sends out the magicians to be crucified because they cannot keep up with Moses. In chapter 12, verse 41, the Pharaoh at the time of Joseph has the baker crucified. Now, Moses lived in 1400 BC. Joseph lived in 1800 BC. Crucifixions did not exist at all in Egypt. They didn't do crucifixions in Egypt. They were first introduced by the Phoenicians in 500 BC. Thus, the Quran's crucifixions are in the wrong place, though over 1,000 to 1,300 years too early. And the one crucifixion they should have got right, the one of Jesus Christ, in chapter 4, verse 157, they completely deny and say it never happened, that there that he never was crucified. Yet when you look at the historical record, look at Thallus, a Greek, and Phlegon, both Greeks, they were debating the crucifixion in 52 AD. That's within 20, 20 years of Christ's death. Lucian, the Greek satirist, talked about it in the second century. Mara Barsarapian's letter to Pagan refers to it in the 73 AD. Josephus, a Jewish historian, writes about it the end of the first century uh, and refers to it. And Tacitus, who hated Christians, he was a Roman historian, not only mentioned it, but mentioned it happened during the time of Pontius Pilate under the authority of Tiberius. That's why we know it happened in 33 AD. That's the historical record. This chapter 4, verse 157 of the Quran doesn't even get to be written down till the 8th century. That's 700 years too late. It's also got the wrong Mary in chapter 19. It says that she is a sister of Aaron, yet she is the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a sister of Aaron. In chapter 66, she is the daughter of Imran, who is Umra in our Bible. And in Surah 20, verse 30, that uh, Aaron is the brother of Moses. Now, hold on a minute. We do know that Moses and Aaron do have a sister, uh, did have a sister. Her name was Miriam. The three of them were all children of Amran. It looks like they've got the Miriam of the Old Testament mixed up with mother of Jesus. There's 1,400 years between them. Obviously, this is a historical anachronism. It confuses the Qibla in chapter 2. It mentions that the Qibla was changed from the farthest mosque down to the great mosque. That would be Mustafa al-Haram, which would be today, that would be Mecca. The difficulty is look at all the mosques. Up until all the mosques that have been found from the 7th century up until the 8th century, up until 706, are facing Petra. None are facing Mecca. They don't begin to face Mecca until 727. That is the 8th century. That's 100 years after the Quran. The Qibla was supposedly canonized. It confuses the Kaaba in chapter 5, too. 
3, 14, and 22. It mentions that Abraham rebuilt the Kaaba there. What was Abraham doing in Mecca? I don't know. Uh, but we do know that there is no reference. We've just got a new inscription that now says that this Mustaf al-Haram, this where the Kaaba is situated, was actually created in 697, the late 7th century. It confuses Pharaoh in the Tower of Babel and Haman, mentioning that Pharaoh talks about Haman uh, and says that he is to kindle for me a large tower. Now, Haman, first of all, is not an Egyptian name. It's an Assyrian name. What's more, this uh, the, the Egyptians did not build towers. They built pyramids. Pharaoh lived in 1500 BC. Haman in the Bible lived in 510 BC. They never met each other. There was a thousand years between them. So you can see another historical anachronism. It says that Alexander the Great was an amazing engineer, built a sheet of iron, a wall between two mountains made out of iron and copper. Hold on a minute. A Alexander Great making that large a wall in 330 BC. There's no record of such a wall in its three biographies written about him. And such a seat of feet would be one of the most great, amazing engineering uh, feats of all time. And it gets the coins mixed up. In chapter 12, verse 20, it says that, that uh, Joseph is sold for a few dirham counted out. That means coins in the time of Joseph. Joseph lived in 1800 BC. Coins were not created until 600 BC by the Lydians. The dirham was only introduced in 661 by the Sufyani family. So obviously this was not a coin of dirham at the time of Muhammad. That's why I don't go to the Quran to find out my history. If you want to find the same story in the Bible in Genesis 37, verse 28, it re-mentions that Joseph was sold for 20 shekels. That is 0.2% of a kilo of silver. That's the right per percentage. That's the right coin. It's not coin. This is a weighted measure. And that's exactly what a slave costs, according to the Muzi tablets that are found in Iraq from that time. Now let's go and ask how is it that the Quran was put together? Well, we do know that it borrowed many stories. According to Islam, it has always existed. Therefore, it would not borrow anything. If anything, it would be the original of all the other stories. Yet when we look at the Quran, look at the Torah story of Cain and Abel from Surah 5, verse 31 and 32. That comes from the Targum of Jonathan ben Isaiah and the Mishnah Sanhedrin, written in the 2nd and 5th century. The story of Solomon and Sheba in chapter 27. That comes from the 2nd Targum of Esther. Story of Jesus in the palm tree in chapter 19, lost books of the Bible. And I could go on and on. There is so much of the Quran that is borrowed from Jewish sources, from Christian and sectarian writings, apocryphal writings. We find it from Ethiopic writings. We find it from Zoroastrian writings. We are now amalgamating and putting together and finding exactly where these stories are. More about that later in this lecture. Let's go and talk about the compilations itself. Now, this is what the traditions tell us. This is not me. Sahih Buhari is the one that's going to give you what they say. And what Sahih Buhari says is that Muhammad died in 632. Uh, the Quran was compiled in 652. But Al-Bukhari is writing about its compilation in 870. Folks, that's 240 years late. Everything we know about how the Quran was put together was not written down while Muhammad was living, was not written down while the Quran should have been written down. It was all the story redacted back 240 years later. That's the problem. And here's the story right here. Here's Sahih Buhari. I'm not going to read it. It's too long. It'll take me too much time. When you get the PowerPoint, read it yourself. This is chapter six. I mean, uh, volume number six, Hadith number 509. Basically, this is the first compilation. According to this, uh, these writings here, when uh, the, when, Umar uh, Abu Bakr was caliph in 632, uh, between 632 and 634. There was a battle in Yamama. Uh, there were people that had memorized the Quran. They died in the battle. Their memory went with them. So immediately they got Zaid ibn Thabit to write the Quran in its original form. He refuses to do it. They said, you must do it. You were the secretary of Muhammad. You need to write it. He writes it down. That's the first compilation. It was given to Abu Bakr, who gave it to Umar, who gave it to his daughter named Hafsa, who had been a wife of Muhammad, and she put it under her bed. She left it under her bed for 20 years. Let's turn the page. The next hadith, 510, also volume 6. Now, in this, there's another battle. Now we're at the time of Uthman, 20 years later. There's a battle way up in Azerbaijan. And the Muslims that are there, they come from Syria, from Iraq, and also from Medina. And they go to a mosque and pray. And as they're praying, those in Medina hear a different prayers from different recitations of the Quran. And they start fighting. They go to blows. 
And then they come down, Udaima comes down all the way down to Medina, and he goes to Uthman. He says, we've got to do something. We must not have different Qurans. Let's rewrite it. So they take Zaid ibn Thabit's copy that was from Hafsa. They take it out, and he rewrites it in the Qureshi dialect. And then that is sent to five cities. And all the other manuscripts, everything else that disagreed with it, were then burnt. They were burnt so that there would not be any deformed or corrupted copies. So that happens in according to according to these traditions here in 652 AD. Now here's some questions. Why did God choose a language which could not accommodate the Quran? You can see as we get into it, there were no dots and vowels when the Quran, uh, the Arabic that was used in the Quran was first used. We'll talk more about that. Why did God choose a man who could not read and write? Why in the world did he give his revelation to an illiterate man? if it was the most important revelation in the history of mankind. Why did Muhammad learn to not learn to read and write? He had 22 years. It only took me two weeks to learn how to read Arabic, and I don't know Arabic. He knew Arabic, so he could certainly have read it if he just studied it in two weeks. And why did his secretary, who did know how to read and write, why didn't he write this down? Why didn't Abu Bakr make copies immediately in 634 and send them to the provinces? Muslims say 1,000 died in Yamama and battled in 632. Well, actually, according to the traditions, only 70 died, which proves that memorization is not good enough. If 70 dead creates a crisis, so much so they have to write it down, then memorization is not good enough, though Muslims like to claim such. How could there be dialectical differences in the mid-7th century? I don't want to get into this. A huge problem. I'm not even going to. We're going to talk about it a little later. And why did Uthman burn all the other copies if they were perfect? Well, let's go back one. And then Muslims claim they were burned because of differing dialects. Absolutely not. If you know Arabic, you cannot have dialectical differences in a written text without vowelization. The Dhamma, the Kassar, and the Fatah. There were no vowels in the 7th century. So this was not for dialectical differences. The fact that Zaid ibn Thabit came upon Surah 33, according to that tradition, shows that it was still not even complete there in the time of both 632 and 652. If there was a second Quran in 652, why are there now so many different Arabic Qurans? We'll get to that. And if five to nine copies were made for each province, where are they today? Show me even one. Now, according to what the Muslims tell us, this is their tradition. This is their story, not my story. This is what happened. Muhammad dies in 632. Uthman makes the final Quran, the, the final com uh, compilation in 652. That was sent to five cities, Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and Damascus. They're all there. There's the five circles, <clears throat> five cities, two in Arabia, two in what is today Iraq, and one in what is today Syria. Now, uh, they were sent so that there would be no more other Qurans, that there would be now a standard Quran. But here's the problem. A Quran suddenly appears in Damascus, written by Ubay ibn Kab, who is a companion of the Prophet. It has 116 surahs, according to the traditions. That's Two more than what are in the Quran today. Ibn Masud, just south of Baghdad, he creates a Quran, writes another Quran in the late 7th century, and it only has 110 surahs. That's less than the Quran we have today. Ibn Musa creates another Quran in Basra. That's the other red circle. It has 114, but it has thousands of manuscript variants. So there were at least five Qurans in the 7th century from Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, Damascus. We don't even have one of them today. Not one. Not one of those five. But something happens between the 7th and 8th century, and this is where the Kirats begin to be introduced. So the Qurans beginning. According to Muhammad, we begin with one Quran. Jibril had seven readings, according to what Muslims tell us. But then we go to seven Qurans because... They needed a different dialects. This is what the Muslim traditions tell us. Uthman's Qureshi Quran in 652 then puts it right back to one Quran sent to five cities. So where did the 30 Kirat Qurans come from if there's only one Quran at the time of Uthman in 652? Why has it become such an issue today? Well, let's look and see. These are the diacritical variants that we introduced in 2016. The um, woman that you see in the bottom picture with the glasses on, that's Hatun Tosh. She is an amazing woman. Uh, she is my colleague. And back in 2013, she was down in North Africa, went into a bookstore to find an Arabic Quran. The man behind the counter said, well, which Quran are you talking about? She says, well, there's this is only one Arabic Quran. He says, no, I have Afsir, I have Warsh, I have Kalun, I have Kasai, I have Imkatir. She says, okay, give me all. So she bought all of them, brought them back to London, showed them to me. I started laughing because I didn't know that these still existed. These are known as Kira'ats. 
means readings, different readings of the Quran. These are Arabic Qurans. These are not translation. These are Arabic Qurans. She said, are they different? I said, yes, there, there are hundreds. There are thousands of differences. But I thought these had all been thrown into the Nile River back in 1924 when they canonized it down to one text. So she said, well, how many are there? I said, well, there will be about 30 of them. So she decided to go out and look for them. And so she went, uh, she had people go to Jordan, to Morocco, and to Yemen, to Sana, and to go into bookstores. And she came up by 2016. She had 26 different Qurans. We took them down to Speaker's Corner. If you go on Fander Films, you'll see us holding them up. The Muslims had a furore. They did not know what to do with this. Look at the picture on the right. See the tall man there with the beard? That is Muhammad Hijab, one of the leading authorities on the internet. He has a following of half a million. He was in the crowd that day. He knew what that we were going to be there. He did not know what we were going to do. And when we held them up, he got outside of the crowd and he said, all the Muslims, leave, leave. Do not look at what they're showing you. Do not listen to what they're saying. I will explain it to you. So he decided he would explain it to him. This is in June of 2016. So what are we talking about? Well, the Arabic which is used in the Quran today does not come from the Hijaz, uh, but from much further north, from Nabatea. The Arabic was Nabatean Aramaic. Today's current Arabic has 28 letters. Seventh century Nabatean Arabic only had 14 to 16 consonantal letters, or what they know as rosms. Obviously, this caused a problem in understanding what was being written. A single consonant letter could be pronounced five different to eight different ways, depending on where you put the dots and vowels. Thus, in the 8th century, dots, which are known as ijams and vowels, haraka, were added to the script to help Muslims read the text. Here is a manuscript. This is a normal manuscript. On the left is the Samarkand manuscript, and on the right is the Sana manuscript. These are two of the six earliest manuscripts. You notice there's no dots above or below them. There's no vowels, no slash, fata, which would be the ah sound, no little curly cue above the, the, the line, which would be hama, which would be the u sound, and no slash below the letter, which would be a kasva, which would be the e. There's no fata, dama, or kasa, a, u, or e on any of these manuscripts. They're just consonantal texts. That's they are, just consonantal scripts. So today, of the 28 letters that exist in the Arabic today, Six of them don't need these dots. The aleph doesn't need a dot. The kaf doesn't need a dot. Or the lam, or the mim, or the ha, or the wow. Those six don't need dots. The other 22 now need dots. That's today's Arabic. That's why many Muslims do not understand this argument, because they think that this is the same Arabic back then as it is today. No, don't take off all those dots, and that's what Arabic would have been like in the 7th century. How is that important? Well, just look at one letter. This is a normal letter, a smiley face. You put one dot above it, you get the the na, the n letter. You put two dots above it, you get the t letter, ta. You get three dots above it, you get the th, tha. You put one dot below it by itself, it's the ba, and two dots is the ya. So na, ta, tha, ba, ya. You can get five different letters by putting those dots. Those dots did not exist in the seventh century. So you can see why you can get five different letters now. That means if those dots aren't there, you can pretty much put dots where you want to. Neither did the vowels. This is where you get your dialectical differences. You, to get different dialects, you need to use these three vowels, either short or long, the dama, the kasra, or the fata. Now, as a result, yeah, when you put these together in words, take a look here. Here are 19 different words just with different dots. All the same letters, except they put, I put the dots in a different place, and I put the dama, fata, and kata in different places. You can get 19 different words just with three. Can you imagine what you have if you have a whole sentence of these or a whole surah of these? So let's look at the 50, the 30. Now, this is what happened. I'm, this I'm, I got from the Wikipedia, but I put dates to it. This is what Muslims don't want me to do. At the very beginning, there were seven that were chosen. Once you put dots and then the, then everybody decided to put their dots where they wanted to. And there is no official person to do that. So in uh, five different cities, in Medina, in Mecca, in Basra, Damascus, and in Kufa, those five cities, you had different men putting their dots where they wanted to. And each one put their name to their dots. So Nafi was in Medina. Abu Kathir was in Mecca. Abu Amr was in Basra, Am Ibn Amir was in Damascus, Asa was in Kufa, Hamza was in Kufa, and al Qasai was in Kufa. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Look at the dates. Look at the death dates. Look when they died. 785, 738, 770, 736, 745, 772, 805. Not one of these men knew Muhammad. 
So how did they know where to put their dots? Not one of these seven men lived in the same century that Muhammad. And five of them didn't even live in the same area. They lived in Iraq and Syria. So this is 100 years later or more, because you go up to the ninth century here. These are men that never knew Muhammad. Who chose them? This guy chose him, Ibn Mujahid. He chose him in the 10th century. This is 300 years later. You get seven different Qurans that were considered to be official. These are known as the readers or the kiraj, or in some call them the ahruf. But that is not the Quran that I have in my hand today. None of those seven are here. This Quran, the official Quran, this is the Quran that every Muslim uses today. Well, 93% of all Muslims today use. This is the Hafs Quran. Do you see Hafs name there? His name is not there for a very good reason. He was chosen in the 12th century. In 1194, uh, this man here, al shatabi that's 500 years after Muhammad, decided to add another two for each one of the, of the readers. He added two disciples, transmitters. So now seven times two, you get 14. Do you see Huff's name there? He is from Asim. He is from Kufa. He died in 796. He died in the late 8th century. He never knew Muhammad. Yet this is the Quran that has been chosen. Hold on a minute. That now makes 21 different Qurans, 21 different sets of dots and vowels, 21 set different sets of different ways of reading it. But that still wasn't good enough. In the, <laughs> in the 15th century, in 1429 is when he died. A guy named Al-Jazari chose another three readers with two students from every one of the three readers. That made another nine. So now we have seven plus 14 plus nine. We now have 30 different Qurans by the 15th century. That's 800 years after Muhammad. These are the official 30. Chosen from how many? From roughly 700 Qurans. 700 different Qurans. So you may say, well, aren't they all the same? Why would you put your name to them if they were all the same? Why would you even have a different Quran to be memorized if they were all the same? We have done, we decided to do and ask this question. How different are these Qurans? You want to see how? If you look at Hafs, I've just circled his name. He is the official one that is being used today because he was chosen in 1985 to do so. When you compare him against all the other 29, there are 93,263 differences. Let me repeat that. 93,263 differences. That means 93,000 words, which means 93,000 different meanings, which means 93,000 different theologies, different doctrines, and different practices. Can you see how devastating this is? No wonder this caused such a fury all over the Muslim world. Here is just the 26 that we put up. You can see the different names. These are the 26 that Hatun found in 2016. That was in 2016. She now has found all 30 of them, and she's found seven more, because between 1924 and 1936, another seven were then added by the Egyptian government. But let's just look at these 26 that she held up. Here you have Dr. Perny Powers from Australia. He has 23. His team is doing an amazing job looking at all the manuscript variants. Here is Hatun's complete uh, uh, collection of 37 Qurans, 37 different Qurans. Now let's look at some of the variants. You might say, oh, they're not that different. That's what Muslims will try to tell you. Here on the left, you have chapter 3, verse 146. It says katala. You notice if you look at where the green is underlined, do you see the fata 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 after katala? And you notice that means fought. Look on the right in Warsh, which is the second most popular Quran today. Instead of a fata, you have a dama, and then you have a kasra, and then you have a fata. So it's kutila. Do you see the little curly cue above the ka? And then you see the the uh, the kasra among the ta, and then you see the fata uh, above the lam. That changes the word from fought to were killed. So did the prophets simply fight according to Hafs or were they killed according to Warish? If I were a prophet, I would rather fight than be killed as the former survives according to Hafs. That changes the story. Here on the left in chapter 43, verse 19, I could go to 93,000 of these. I'm just going to show you four as an example. On the left, you see slaves, ibadu. So you have a you have a kasra and then you have a fata and then you have a dama making it ibadu there in that on the Hafs on the Rao, it is now a Kasra, and it's no, and they've taken off the Fatta and they've taken off the Dagar Alaf, and they instead of the Dhamma, they've changed it to a Fatta. So now it's Inda. Instead, on the left, the Hafs has slaves, and they make the angels who are slaves of the beneficent me females. On the right now, it says, and they make the angels who are in the presence of the beneficent. Now, are the angels slaves of Allah or simply in the presence of Allah? 
Is it the slaves or those in the presence who are made females? Now, if I were an angel, I would prefer being in God's presence rather than his slave. And if I were an angel, I would prefer if they, only the slaves were made females, thank you, not myself because I'm a male. So you can see that has lots of uh, problems. Here you have Isanan on the left for Hafs, and you have in Alduri you have uh, you have Husnan. One is doing good, and the other is beauty. So, and we have enjoined on man doing good to his parents, or according to Alduri, and we have enjoined on men beauty to his parents. Are men supposed to do good or be beautiful to their parents? Well, I'm a parent. I have three sons. I would prefer my sons be good rather than be good looking. So here you have, and this is one of the most damaging ones, chapter 98, verse 6. Albareati just changed to Albareati with a glottal stop. Isn't that interesting? Just by changing a few vowels here, notice what happens. Indeed, they were disbelieved among the people of the scriptures that polytheists will be the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. Those are the worst of creatures, has now been changed to those are the worst of the innocent. This is talking about us as Christians. Are we the worst of creatures, according to Huffs, or are we innocent? That's a huge difference. I like to know as a Christian. And what in the world are innocent Christians, Jews, and polytheists doing in hell, according to us? So can you see, I'm sorry, according to Huffs. I'd rather go with, with Waters on this one. So you can see this has theological differences. This has doctrinal differences. And as far as for us as Christians, it has practical differences. So enormous amount of changes, so much so that there is the man on the left there. Notice that's Muhammad Hijab. He was there watching us hold up these kid'ats there in 2016. Four years later, in June 8th, he decided to go to the man on the right. That is Dr. Yasar Qadi. Dr. Yasar Qadi is the world's leading authority in the Quran, did his doctoral thesis at Yale University in 1995 on this very problem. On this very problem. So who better to ask? What is? How do we solve this problem? So he has a Zoom call, and I'm there watching it, so are others. We're watching it live. And it was for about 28 minutes. And he, the first question he asked, there is Muhammad Hijab in London, Yasar Qadi, who lives in Texas, Houston, Texas, sorry. He is answering the call. And the first thing that Muhammad Hijab does is he holds out his hand and he points to his palm. And he says, I'm giving you a clear sheet of paper. Which kira'at? Which one? The hafs, the wars, the kilu? Which is the one that's eternal? Which is the one that was revealed to Muhammad? Which is the one that Uthman wrote before he could finish? Yasar Khan said, do not ask me this question. We do not talk about this in public. Turn off the camera. Come afterwards, after this interview, and we'll have a deep dive, and I'll explain it to you. And Muhammad Hijab said, this should be easy. Which one? Yasar Khan said, this is the most difficult question for the last thousand years for scholars. And he says, we in, in Islam, we have a respect for the Quran. We put a red line, and we don't go beyond that red line. We don't ask certain questions of the Quran. But when I was at Yale University, there are no red lines. You can ask any questions at Yale University. So Muhammad said, Job said, is this where you had your crisis of faith? He said, no, 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 yes, Al-Qadi said, no, not my crisis of faith, crisis of knowledge. He says, the Western scholars have come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. And they're looking at us Muslims like the emperor with no clothes. And then he turns to, yes, to Muhammad Hijab and he says, you in the East, interesting, isn't it? You in the East, he's in London, yet that's the East. Your standard narrative has holes in it. Ooh, two, 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 two. And that's where he coined the phrase. The standard what narrative? The standard Islamic narrative. S-I-N. Are you getting it? The standard Islamic narrative has holes in it. Ooh, I love that. That's where it was all coined on June 8, 2020. He still wasn't answering the question. So finally, at the end of 28 minutes, after Yasser Qadi says, I've never lectured on this. I never will lecture on this. You'll never see me talk about this in public. Muhammad Hijab said, okay, well then tell me which Quran. Tell me which Quran is the eternal Quran. Which one of these? And after being pushed for 28 minutes, Dr. Qadi finally admitted, they are all the Quran. You take a little bit of Hafs. You take a little bit of what? You take a bit of little Kalud. You take a little bit of Kasai and you... Stir them up, and what you get is the Quran today. I started clapping. I was I was watching this live, and I immediately recorded this and put it on my computer. Because here he was admitting to the whole world, the world's leading authority on the Quran, that there was not just one Quran. There were 30 different Qurans, all amalgamated into what we have today. Oh, I loved it. Oh, that was fun.
What he didn't know, because we know that and he does it, there are 93,236 differences between the other 29 and just us. Can you imagine what he has admitted? By that time, that was June 8th. Within two weeks, they had both put, they put this interview up on both of their YouTube sites. Within two weeks, they had to stop the comments because so many hundreds of Muslims were commenting and saying, because of what that interview, I am no longer a Muslim. I have left Islam. You are the ones that said not one word, not letter has been changed. And now you admitted that there are thousands of differences. And my blood will be on your shoulder. Within two weeks, they had to shut down all the comments. Within two months, by August of 2020, they had to delete that interview from both their sites. That's how damaging that interview was. Folks, he was just being honest. Can you see how damaging this does to the Quran? Now, what about the manuscripts? Because this is even more damaging. Let's go back to the word. Those are the dots and vowels that were put on in the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. What about the early 8th century? The early, what about the original text that the dots were added to? Here is the original text. These are the manuscripts, and there are six of them. And this is what I debated in 2014 with Dr. Shabir Ali. That debate called the classic debate, you can watch it. It's only two hours long. Over a million people have watched it. I know of at least a hundred people that have given their life to the Lord because of that one debate. And all I did was show these different manuscripts. The one on the left is the Topkapa manuscript. Uh, that is in Turkey. That is considered to be the best of all the manuscripts. I've got that manuscript in my library, in my office. And if you look at that manuscript, it's written in the Kufic text. It has a few dots in red that were added at a later date. But that manuscript is about 99% of the Quran. It disagrees with the Quran I have in my hand today in two 2,270 different places, 2,270 different manuscript variants. It was written in the mid 8th century. This is 100 years after Muhammad. The one on the left is, um, on the right, is the Samarkand. That is from Tashkent in Uzbekistan. It only goes up to Surah 43. Half the Quran is missing. It has so many manuscript variants. It has so many grammatical mistakes uh, and that it is considered an embarrassment by Muslim scholars today. Don't use it because it is written by amateurs. We go then to the Ma'il manuscript, which is in London, my favorite manuscript, because it's right there in London where we where I lived for 25 years. It is a Ma'il script. That means it's in a slanted script. It also only has, to, uh, I'm sorry, the Samarkand. Let's go back. The Samarkand is dated to the mid-8th century. We go to the Ma'il. It's dated to the late 8th century. Notice, not 7th century, 8th century, around 790. And it has a slanted text. It only goes up to Surah 43. It is full of manuscript variants. The Petropolitanus in Paris, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, there in Paris, it is only about 19%. There is a fragment that's about 23%. It has 93 different manuscript variants just within that 19%. And it is dated to about 720. So the Husseini manuscript, which is the one on the left, is in Cairo. Uh, it is a monumental text. If you look at it, you will see it is probably from the 9th century, not even the 8th century. Uh, it is covering, you can see some of the coverings right on that page. Uh, it is hundreds and thousands of these coverings. Take a look. Uh, uh, if, if you look at it, these coverings are covering words. They're covering phrases. They are sanitizing the text. They're censoring the text. And the, what they don't cover, what is left behind, it now corresponds with the Huff's text that we use today. That's why it is such a problematic text. The one on the right is the by far the most exciting. This is the Sana'a manuscript that was discovered in 1975 in the Sana'a mosque in the dome. If you look on the right side, you will see above the yellow line is Surah 19, and below that yellow mark is Surah 22. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Well, they're on the left side. They start on the left side. But you notice there are two different scripts between the right page and the left page. Ah, there's about 60 years between those two texts. On the right side is what we know as, uh, is, is dated to around 705. That's the 8th century beginning. This is the oldest manuscript that exists in the world today. On the left side is about 60 years later. This is not a uh, this is not a picture of the original. This is a facsimile of Dr. Garrett Prince, and he showed me it when I went to visit him. Right, this is his man, his. Um, uh, this is his photocopy of the manuscript. And he noticed, he says, look at all those orange marks. Every time you see an orange mark, that is a manuscript variant. There's over a thousand manuscript variants between this text and the text we use today. What's most exciting, 
underneath is another text. This is called a palimpsest. Now, it's not in this picture here, but they've now been able to separate the lower text from this upper text. And there are 63 verses in that lower text that do not correspond with the 705 text above it. When they look at the 63 verses, there are 70 manuscript variants between just the two layers. The lower layer was probably the later part of the 7th century. The upper layer is 705. So between 690 and 705, there are 70 different different changes in the Quranic text. These are just 63 verses out of 6,000 that exist in the Quran today. So what are a summary? When you look at these six earliest Quranic manuscripts, not one of them is from the seventh century. Not one of them are complete. None of them completely agree with each other. None of them completely agree with the current 1924 Huff's text. All of them have hundreds and even thousands of subsequent manuscript variants. So when was the Quran completed? Well, before we do that, let's just look at this Hasana. There is the two texts. Let me just so you see it there. You can see the under text and the upper text. That is what we discovered in 19, 1975. Now, 63 verses, 70 variants. Verbs are missing. Prepositions, isolated lessons are different. Entire sentence, 16 times don't make the sense. This is not a school text as Asma Hilali. This is a nascent Quran that has been washed off and rewritten over top with the changes that have been made in 705. That's exactly what's going on there. Now, let's go to the carbon datings because the carbon datings are what Muslims like to point out to show you that the Quran is from the 7th century. They sent a piece of the Sana manuscript that we just looked at to four different laboratories in Europe, uh, one to the uh, one to Lyon in France, and they dated a portion, the same portion to to all four laboratories, and they dated the one page to, uh, using carbon dating fourteen, and that one uh, dated uh, between three eighty up to five fifty. They sent another one to Kiel in Germany, and they dated in their uh, carbon dating from about 410 up to 460 AD. Then they sent another one to the uh, Zurich uh, in Switzerland, and that dated it from about 460 up to 550. And the last one they sent to Oxford in England, and they dated that fragment uh, from about 500 to 550. Now note, these were all dated between 390 to 550. You notice, Look at Muhammad's life. There's Muhammad's life. I've just circled it in the blue there. He was lived between uh, 570 and 632. So these are 80 to 220 years too early for his life. But when the Quran was finally compiled, the Uthmanic recension, there I've just circled it. That's 652. These are 100 to 206 years too early. So they all predate these fragments, all predate not only Islam, but they predate Muhammad and the Quran. In, in 2015, Birmingham University came out with what they call the Birmingham Quran. This is the first Quran, the oldest Quran, because carbon dating at the Oxford lab, the same one that I just, they did the Sana'a manuscript, dated it to, um, from 568 to 645. Muhammad was born in 570, died in 632. So this covers the lifespan of Muhammad, proving they said that this is the oldest Quran. Dr. David Thomas, who is a, cur a curator for that uh, library said the writer of this manuscript could well have known the prophet Muhammad. He would have seen him probably. He would maybe have even heard him preach. He may have known him personally. And that really is quite a thought to conjure. But here's the problem, folks. It's only two pages. It's just 33 verses They're, uh, from three different surahs, surah 18, 19, and 20. 33 verses out of 343 verses, that's just 10%. This is not a full manuscript. What's more, out of 6,236 verses in the Quran, that's a very minuscule part of the Quran. What's interesting is look at those 33 verses. Chapter 18, verse 17 to 31, is about the seven sleepers of Ephesus. That's a story that was cre recreated by the Bishop Jacob of Saruk in 512 AD. In chapter 19, the story there is from Proto-Evangelium of James from 145 AD, then was repeated in the Pseudo-Gospel of Matthew in 600 AD. Surah 20, verse 1 to 40, is the story of Moses straight out of the Bible from 1400 BC, which means all of these three stories have nothing to do with Islam. They predate Islam. They predate Muhammad. They predate the Quran. Can you see that these are stories that already exist? These are Christian 
apocryphal writings and Jewish apocryphal writings, and then part of the Bible itself that were then borrowed. They were already written in Arabic. Of course, they were written in Arabic because they were Arab Jews and Arab Christians, and then incorporated into the Quran in chapter 18, 19, and 20. I won't go into all the conclusions there. You can read them for yourself. I want to go into the 4,000 early manuscript variants, the work that is done by Dr. Brubaker. There's his book. Go buy it. And he found four types of variants, insertions. He also found erasers. He also found erasers overwritten. And he found overwriting without erasers. And selective coverings, 4,000 of these he has been able to find throughout the Quran. Selective coverings overwritten, tapings. When you look at that, you can see, folks, that this completely shuts down any notion the Quran has not been changed. 4,000 consonantal giving to variants proves that the Quran has been changed wholesale. When a Muslims try to come up in 2019 with a full Quran, when we asked them to do that, 2019, that's just four years ago. This is a debate I'm having with Mansur Ahmed, the, probably the world authority on the manuscripts on the right there at Speaker's Corner. In June of 2019, we had this debate, and he claimed that they have all the manuscript. They can take, they can get the entire Quran all the way back to Uthman. I said, where is it? He said, well, we have 97% of it. What did he mean, 97? If you look at his website, he's talking about this. He's talking about 63 fragments that make up 97%. 20 of them that I'm putting up there right now that he's looked at, and I've got them, and we've looked at them. These ones are tentatively dated. There's disagreement between scholars. There's no conclusion on all any of those 20. He should not have used those. Nine of them, including the one that's half the Quran that they need 50% from, uh, are all dated after 719. He should not have used any of those nine. And 34 of them, in other words, half of them, we have no way of knowing because no one's done any work on them. So why did he even use them? It's obvious he needed them to make up 97%. He just grabbed them thinking that no one would check up on him. We checked up on him and we shut that down in so quick face. That's why be careful what you say in public. We'll take it to pieces if it is not authoritative. So let me just go ahead and talk about when the Huff's checks came into being. The Huff's text that we use today was, was actually chosen by Muhammad Ali al-Husseini al-Haddad 99 years ago in 1924, just for the city of Cairo. That then was chosen for all of Egypt in 1936, 87 years ago, as the Faro condition. Because that was so successful in 1985 in Saudi Arabia, uh, they then chose the Hafs as the world edition for the whole world. That's 38 years ago, folks. Now, let me, this is, I'm going to end with this. This is probably the most devastating material. And this is ex most exciting. When you look at the Quran, remember I talked about all the dots. This man here, Dr. Guntur Luning, in 1970, decided to take the dots off this beautiful poetry and replace it with Aramaic dots. When he did that, by putting Aramaic dots onto an Arabic from the Arabic text, he was able to go back and find that this beautiful poetry in the Quran comes from Christian hymns written in Aramaic by Christians. He got the highest grade you could get, Eximum Opus, there in Germany, and he was thrown out of the university and into obscurity. We tra translated his text into English, which brought him out of obscurity, so he died a happy man in 2014. Christoph Luxemburg took what Gunther Luning did and decided to look at the 25% of the Quran that no one understands. A quarter of the Quran, even the scholars don't understand. And he took the dots off and replaced it with some Aramaic dots. He did seven different layers of process. You can look at them all there. I won't go into them. By replacing all the dots with Aramaic dots, this is what he found. All this 26% of the Quran was then unpacked. And he found that these dark passages were Christian lectionaries, Christian homilies, and Christian hymns, all about Jesus Christ. If you take off the dots out of the Arabic and put it, replace it with the Aramaic dots from, from where these were lifted from, you go back to Jesus. It's not what they found, it's who they found. The conclusion is, when you look at the manuscripts, you notice that the Aramaic texts were first in from Aramaic. They were then translated into Arabic in the 7th century, but they didn't have dots and vowels. That's why when you look at the Arabic manuscripts from the 8th and 9th century, there are no dots and vowels. Once you put dots and vowels in, on between the 8th and 10th century, that's where you get the many different Qurans. There has been a manipulation, a change, all the way through. So let's conclude this talk. We investigated 13 areas. We looked at what do modern Muslim leaders claim, what did early Muslim scholars say, comparing the two. 
or you looked at some historical anachronisms, also source criticism. We looked at the two compilations of the Quran and the 30 late diacritical variants, uh, all of them from the Arabic Qurans. We then went to the six earliest chronic manuscripts and then covered the two layers of the Sana'a palimpsest and the four carbon dating lab reports. From there, we covered and looked at the 4,000 early constantal variants that Dan Brubaker found, and then we shot through the 63 earliest extant fragments that the Muslims claim to prove they have a complete Quran. From there, we went to the 1924 Hafs canonized text, the one that is used today, and then we ended with the Aramaic proto-Quran. And what have we concluded? Well, we can say that or our remit was to investigate both the Mecca of the Hijaz, Muhammad of the 7th century, and the Quran of the 7th century. Now, it is obvious that everything Muslims are dependent on for their book, their man, and their place are based on the standard Islamic narrative, which are their traditions, all of which are two to three hundred years too late and hundreds of miles too far north. When we zeroed on Mecca, we proved that it was probably the biggest of all the problems for Muslims. The standard Islamic narrative refers to this place uh, where Adam and Eve were sent to, therefore the oldest inhabitant of mankind in existence, that it has much vegetation and there were about 300 prophets were, that were buried there. Where are they? We can't find any support for any of that. The earliest reference we find for Mecca is not referred to until 741. That's almost a hundred years after Muhammad, who, if he did live, supposedly died. And all the earliest maps, including those that go right back to the second century, Ptolemy's material, have n no reference to Mecca on them. We looked at Patricia Cron's debunking of Montgomery Watt's trade route theory which he did in 1987. Then we debunked the Red Sea trade route theory th through Arabia, proving it was all the trade went via Africa on the western coast, and all of it was maritime. It all went by water. We looked at the 7th century Qiblas, looking at Dan Gibson's material, showing that they all faced Petra up until 706, and Mecca was not even realized or even known as a direction for Qibla until 729 A.D. That's almost 100 years after supposedly the Qibla was canonized. We asked him whether Mecca was known and the surrounding empires could not find one reference to Mecca in any of the surrounding empires. And then we looked at the five stages of the Hajj and noticed that they were all simply borrowed from other places, mostly from Jerusalem. We then looked at the coins and we noticed that all the coins in the seventh century, they were actually minted by Christians including Mu'awiyah, all the way up into Abd al-Malik. Mu'awiyah had crosses above his head and was holding a cross. He was not a Muslim. The Iraq inscription supported the coins and showed that there was no reference in any of the earliest rock inscriptions from the 7th century, but all in Arabic, that's true. But look and see where the rock inscriptions are found. They're found in the north, in Nabataean area, what is Jordan today, in the south, in Yemen. And they all all of them are referring to Christian themes. There's no reference to any ma man named Muhammad, any religion called Islam, no reference to any place called Mecca, no reference to any book called the Quran, which they should be replete with because these are the first Islamic inscriptions. And then we turn to the Quran, and when we look at the Quran, we notice that the six earliest manuscripts prove that men created six different Qurans between the 7th and 9th century. The Birmingham folios that have claimed to be the oldest Quran are nothing more than two folios, uh, which are three stories of 33 verses, not a complete Quran, and are stories that predate Islam, predate Muhammad, predate the Quran, suggesting that these were Christian tales and also biblical material straight out of the story of Moses. The 30 Qirats that were considered to be official by the 15th century, the first seven chosen in the 10th century, the next 14 chosen in the 12th century, and the last nine that were chosen in the 15th century were, were so proliferating that by the 20th century, 1924, they had to choose one of those Qurans, and that's the Hafs al-Anasim, uh, the one that we use today, at least 93% of the Muslims use. But when we looked at those 30 Qirats and we were introduced them in uh, 2016 when Hutton and I held them up for the whole world to see, 
we found that they had 93,263 differences between them. This kind of shuts down any notion that there is only one cron with not one word or one letter changed. This caused such a furore amongst the Muslim world in 2016 that in 2020, that infamous interview between Muhammad Hijab and Dr. Yasser Qadi shot to pieces any notion that there was one Quran that that had not been changed. Caused so much damage, that 28-minute interview, that by two weeks, thousands of Muslims had left Islam, and then within two months, they had to take those interviews off the Internet because they were so damaging to the credibility of the Quran and to the preservation of the Quran. What was fascinating is the 29 Kirat variants that did not agree with the Hafs, these are the other 29, they'd had to dump them into the Nile in 1924. And this proves that when Muslims find problems with the Quran, they either burn them like, huh, that is what's referred to in what Uthman did in 652, or wash them, that's what we see in the Sana manuscript, or erase them, that's what we see in uh, the Husseini manuscript, or cover them, as we have seen in the top copy in the Samarkand, or they sink them to destroy the evidence. This is typical of what Muslims do when they cannot support their Quran. When we looked at Dr. Dan Brubaker's material on the 4,000 constant variants, they proved that the Muslims have either accreted or deleted or corrupted their text before standardizing it in the last century or possibly within the last uh, the centuries during the Ottoman period. The 63 fragments that Muslims have employed to find just 96% of the Quran proves that they still cannot find a complete Quran even 100 years after Muhammad, and as their fragments are either tentative or have no sources. And the, probably the most damaging, the Aramaic proto-Quran that we looked at that were first introduced by Gunther Luling in the 1970s and then by uh, Christoph Luxemburg in the early part of this century, looking at the 26% of the Quran that is the, the black area, the, the area that scholars don't even understand, he was able to reproduce all of those references, all of those surahs and those verses showing that every one of them, when you take the dots off, the Fatah, the Dhamma, and the Kasra, and replace them with Aramaic dots, suddenly they come to life. These are all hymns. These are homilies. These are poetry. And they're all from lectionaries written by Christians to Jesus Christ. They're all about Jesus. You take out the dots of the Quran and replace it with its original text, and it'll take you back to Jesus. So, in conclusion, what's the overview? What is exactly is happening? Between the 7th and 8th century, Arabs, in order to create their own distinct identity, they needed a book, they needed a man, and they needed a place. Remember, their cousins, the Jews and the Christians, already had a book called the New Old and the New Testament. That's why they needed to have a book. That's why the Quran starts to be introduced in the 8th century. But who is the one that introduced it? You have to have a prophet that does so, and they need a prophetic line. The Jews and Christians had prophetic line through Abraham through Isaac. Their prophetic line was through Ishmael. What happens to Ishmael? He just disappears. No one comes after him. Therefore, they have to introduce their prophet from that line. Now, this did not happen in a 22-year period like Muslims like to claim, like the standard Islamic narrative claims. This happened over centuries. Starting in the 7th century, moving into the 8th century, it was the Abbasids who then finally got their book and their man. Then they had to find a place in order to put him, place him, and to give him a backstory. By the time they got Mecca together, then they had the book, the man, and now they had the place. And now they had to give them a story. That's why the traditions don't begin to appear until the 9th century, until 833 when Ibn Isham first writes down the biography, until 870 when Al-Buhari writes down the Hadith, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Da'at, Tirmid, which can repeat after that, and until the 10th century, 923, when Al-Tabari finally writes down the Tafsir and the Tariq. It takes them two to three hundred years finally to get the book, the man, and the place in the right order. Here's what's interesting. At the very beginning, when I did this debate in 1995, I was told by Dr. Jamal Badari that everything I'm talking about is arguing from silence. No, we are not arguing from silence. We now have the coins. We have the inscriptions. We have the manuscripts. We have the buildings. We have all the artifacts from the 7th and 8th century, which shuts down their arguments. Now, it's not we who are arguing from silence. It is now the Muslims who are arguing from silence. They don't have anything in the 7th century to support Muhammad or the Quran or their place, Mecca. They have to go to the 9th and 10th century to find material that's redacted back to the 7th century. So we're not arguing from silence. They're arguing from silence. And the debate has completely been turned on its head. These arguments 
hit at the very foundations of Islam. Yet, notice everything that I've talked about in these four lessons, in these four lectures, everything that I've gone through are completely neutral. Anybody can use them. These are politically correct. I'm not confronting Muhammad, his his violence or his misogyny against women. I'm not saying anything against Muhammad. I'm just asking a much more basic question. Did he even exist? If he didn't exist, I don't care about his violence. I don't care about his misogyny. See, these questions were asked about Jesus Christ. We've already gone through this. Same questions. And we've answered every one of them for Jesus and for our Bible and for Jerusalem, our book, our man, and our place. So, what can we say in final conclusion? Note, from what we have researched, what we've talked about just in this lecture about the Quran, what can we say? Number one, the Quran was not created by God at all. Number two, the Quran was not sent down to a man named Muhammad between 610 and 632. Number three, the Quran was not completed by Uthman in 652. Number four, the Quran was changed in the last 1300 years. And number five, the Quran was finally compiled not in 652, but 1924, and made official in 1985 for the whole world. Thus, the Quran is a mere, wait a minute, 96, 99, no, 38 years old. Consequently, many of us here who are listening to this are actually older than the Quran. And I will stop there because I see I've gone over my time. I'm sure there might be some questions for you, Peter. Over to you. Well, well, thanks very much, Jay. And uh, that was a, a huge amount of stuff, of course, in, in a very short period of time. And we have used up our full hour, uh, sadly, already. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you <clears throat> one question, really, in closing, because we, we've pretty much run out of time. And I was I was really struck by your comment about the difference between modern day scholars who all claim that the Quran hasn't been changed in 1400 years and claim that the Hafs version is the original one that Uthman authorized and sent out to the five centers. The difference between them and the scholars and writers of the Hadith, compilers of the Hadith back in the 9th and 10th century, who seem to acknowledge that there were all sorts of variations and changes. Now, of course, these people in the 9th and 10th century were still committed Muslims. And I, I guess my question is, does it really matter for Muslims if there have been changes? Or uh, because if we look at the Bible itself, the New Testament documents, there, there are a lot of variations between the different manuscripts that, that we look at. And it, it, it doesn't bother us because we can get back to the original text and because the theology of the New Testament is not threatened by any of these copying errors. So for Muslims, does it, does it really matter? Or is the Quran and its theology consistent enough that it still provides a good foundation for the faith that they can let go of this idea that it hasn't been changed? Great question. Let me answer it real quickly. Here's the problem. It matters absolutely for 99% of Muslims who are not scholars. The Muslims who are not scholars, this is apt sacrosanct. You do not touch the Quran. Why? Because that's the one thing they have to go on. Remember, like, unlike Christianity, where you can sit there and you can criticize the Bible, you can eradicate its authority and its historicity, we still have a relationship with Jesus Christ, all of us. That's why we go on. We don't, re we're not dependent on a Bible to, to either take or give or take away from Jesus Christ. Islam doesn't have that. There is no relationship. All they have is one book that supposedly came from one man, that supposedly came from 20, in a 22 year period in one place. If that is the case, then you can see why they have to hold on to the Quran as eternal and as something that has not come from man. It has to be above it because that's the only thing they have to go on. Secondly, and this is probably much more devastating for the scholars and others, the Quran itself makes that claim that it is eternal. The Quran itself makes that claim that it came to Muhammad. The Quran itself makes that claim that God will provide it, uh, protect it from ever being changed or manipulated or corrupted. So if that is the Quran making that claim, then even the scholars have to make have to give lip service to that. That's why it either going, by the way, now here's what's interesting. This is their primary revelation. There is nothing outside the Quran that really is their primary revelation to who God is, who they are, and what they're to do, uh, how they're to walk, talk, eat, and drink. 
we don't go to the Bible as our primary revelation. It's secondary. It's much like their hadith, their siddah, their tafsir, and their tahrik. The hadith and the siddah would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The tafsir would be Paul's letters, and the hadith would be the book of Acts. So the same genre would be like their traditions. So where's our primary revelation? Our primary revelation is not the Bible. Our primary revelation is Jesus himself. So when you look and you say, ask those four questions, remember the four questions that are applied to the Quran, that it's eternal, sent down, complete, and unchanged. Apply those four questions. We've eradicated them for Islam. Let's apply them to Jesus Christ. Is Jesus eternal? Yes, he is. Was Jesus sent down? Yes, he was. Is he complete? Absolutely. Has he have never changed? He has never changed. The very four things that every Muslim desires and must have for their primary revelation, the Quran, we have in Jesus Christ. So when we, by eradicating that, that those four criteria for the Quran, we bring them home to Jesus Christ. What better revelation than the Logos, the Word of God, who came to earth and died before every Muslim? Let's make sure we bring that into the discussion, because that is where we bring them home. Thank you very much, J.M. We have run out of time, sadly. Uh, that concludes a, a series of four uh, four talks on understanding Islam by Dr. J. Smith. And if you haven't seen the other three, then I'd really recommend that you, you do. They're all available on our website. So do pass the word on to others. Finally, this falls to me, Jay, to say thanks so much again for coming along and, and joining us for the material you presented and uh, most of all for the work that you're you're doing and for making it so accessible to to others this latest research thanks to uh, to all of you for uh, joining us today do spread the word and uh, do pass it on and make use of these resources as we make them available to you so uh, may the lord bless you and we'll see you again soon on icmda webinars thank you <laughs>